we've been doing this workshop and we've been doing this series and as we've been going through, we've been learning all about our armor, but I watched a thing on the TV this last week and it said, in the first five seconds that somebody comes to attack you, your body takes a natural instinct. Either you fight or you flight. So in that first five seconds, you make the split decision to either run away or stay where you're at and fight it. Well, in Ephesians, it tells us when we put on our armor to, therefore, stand. Okay, so that's what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to learn not to run away, not to scatter like wild chickens, but to take root and stand firmly planted, knowing God's got it, right? Spiritually, we need to stand. We ran for too long. So the first week we learned our enemy, then Margaret taught us the belt last week and how we need to align with his standard. He's the truth, and he sets the standard, and he aligns. So this week we're going to cover the breastplate. And we're going to cover two breastplates, and it's all going to tie in together. So the, this woman gives a description of what the heart does, and she says, your heart is beating in your chest. It's dispersing blood through your veins and arteries. It's picking up oxygen and other nutrients and supplying them to places where they can be turned into raw energy. That's why a feeble or malfunctioning heart creates such a noticeable ripple effect throughout a person's entire system. Without the heart's continuous pumping action, the body feels the diminishing effects until ultimately it ceases to function altogether. So your heart is the seat of your life, and it's the source. What the physical heart is to your physical life, the spiritual heart is to your spiritual life. Well, everybody knows the dog's my baby. Half travelers hate pets, but that's me and Bill's baby. Well, last year we took heart problems. His heart no longer functions properly. So I actually, this stood out to me because I've seen the effects a bad heart has. He has no energy. He lays half the time he walks like he's stupid. He falls over. He's got to take multiple medicines just for his heart to beat. We don't want that in our physical life. We want a healthy, physical just like we do here, we want it in our spiritual. We want that healthy and functioning. So Proverbs 4.23 tells us, Guard your heart above all else, for it is the source of life. So once a Roman soldier was fitted with his belt, which is what we studied last week, he then put on, the next piece he put on in that order was the breastplate. It was a middle shield, usually bronze, that was worn over this midsection. And it says it came from the neck, right, down to the thighs. We think of it here, but it actually came down to the thighs. And during Paul's era, this is what they wore for their piece of equipment, and it was usually like over a leather sheath, like garment. And if you actually could afford it, you had to be able to afford it. Thank you with God, you don't need to be able to afford anything. We need to see him, but if you could afford it, you could actually get a coat of mail to put over it for extra protection. It guarded you even more. And I want you to remember that concept as we go on in. Being able to afford an extra piece. Because the thought we have extra benefits, right? So the purpose of all of these layers was to guard the vital organs, particularly the heart. In case of a direct hit to the soldier's upper body, wearing the breastplate would be the difference between life and death. Amen. One swift strike from an enemy sword could stop a man's heart beat cold. So righteousness. The quality of being upright, fulfilling the expectations set in a relationship. In our case as believers, this relationship is with God himself. Righteousness then is upright living that aligns with God's expectations. So righteousness basically boils down to is to be in right standing with God. It's not something we can do on our own, of our own accord. It is God who puts us in right standing with him. Mm -hmm. That is why he sent his son. So we have to understand that. This is similar to what we studied last week when looking at the truth, but there's a new, unique little difference that makes righteousness the more practical of the two. While the lifestyle of a woman girded in the belt of truth affirms God's standards, we know we learned how important it is to affirm God's standard. a woman who puts on the breastplate of righteousness aligns her life to it. We can't just affirm it and understand that it's true. We have to start to align ourselves with God and his will and his ways. So, the truth provides the grace. Righteousness paints the picture. It's right living. In Ephesians 4, 1, it's put, walk, and 
in and have a field day because I just let that breach happen. Amen. In James 4, 17, it says, the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, Amen. sins. Sin exposes you to Satan's jacks. We're not perfect. We are going to sin. We're going to fall short every day. But it's just trying to put up that protective barrier, living the best we can do through God and following his instructions daily. So most of us probably have our own idea of what the Bible means when it refers to the heart. But we're going to look at this idea right now. So human beings are made up of three distinct parts. One, the body. The body allows you to relate to the physical world, the world you live in, this world. Two is the spirit. It allows you to relate to God. That is our God connection, the spirit. It's his spirit. Three is the soul, which allows you to relate to yourself. The your soul is what makes you a unique individual. It's your personality, your distinctive internal nature, and it is composed of four important factors. So, your mind, which is going to be your thoughts. Your will, your ambition. Your emotion is your feelings. Your conscious is going to be your moral compass. When scripture speaks of your heart, it's referring to the intersection of these four internal characteristics. The heart is the centerpiece of the soul. <coughs> well, how many knows when I was looking at that? The thoughts you had, the ambitions you had, your feelings, all of those things when you become a child of God and you start seeking after the ways of God, those things start to change. They start to change. It says, whatever we ask in his name, he will grant us. How is that possible? Because the more we're seeking him and the more these things is changing, we are aligning with the will. We want his will. Well, anything that is his will, he will give us. So those all are going to slowly change as we begin to put on our armor and seek him. So <coughs> the enemy loves to attack those areas. Yes, Lord, you know our your mind. He likes to distort your thinking with lies about God. His word and even yourself trying to cripple your soul for negative, unbiblical thought processes. I know most people don't like to believe it, but we all have those moments. God's not going to give you that. He's not listening to you. Look how much time has passed. That's the enemy attacking our minds. It doesn't matter if it's, oh, I'm 18 years, I'm hanging strong. <laughs> I'm hanging strong. I'm still relying on God that his promises are good. It doesn't matter how much time has passed. That is the enemy attacking our mind. Your will. He likes to redirect your ambitions away from eternal, godly pursuits, luring you towards interests that are temporal, short-sighted, even directly opposed to the will of God. Well, how many of us how we see that is we get hung up on the world, what's going on in the world, what's popular, what's more important, going to the hot cell. It's little distractions. It's little distractions that begin to pull us away and it has no value because the only value is eternal value, and that's temporal value. It says not to store up our treasures here, but in heaven. So the next one is your emotions. Tampering with your feelings, piggybacking on runaway responses like anger, discouragement, revenge, or sadness to persuade you into making unstable choices. Margaret talked about this last week. Our emotions can lead us away. That is exactly what he wants to do. He can, I've seen so many people, and I've noticed it lately, and it's the one thing I've been trying not to do. Okay, I just had to call you a vent. <laughs> I'm not supposed to call them a vent. I don't need to vent that I'm angry. I need to just turn around and get in the prayer closet, and we all do it, and that is literally our emotions being ran right away with us. Your conscience. Influence your conscience so it steers you to live in a way that doesn't line up with biblical guidelines. He loves to lead us astray. He loves to lead us away. He knows what we gain when we are placed. When you choose not to align our actions with God's truth, when you live in blatant rebellion against his will for us, we leave our heart exposed where he can take a clear shot. That is where we don't want that clear shot. That's why we want to have on the breastplate. It's going to be our protection. So wearing the belt of truth, putting on the shoes and helmet, using the shield and sword, will do you no good if you leave your heart open to a full frontal attack by the devil. You must intentionally protect the organ that pumps fragrance into your spiritual life. We need to pray. We need to seek God. We need to ask him to reveal anything spoiled that's in our life. We all get a little bit of spoiled fruits that we don't realize is there and how the problem is out of control. But if we can ask him to reveal it, he'll reveal it to us. And when he reveals it to us, through him, we can change it. We don't want to leave it there rotting. We wouldn't leave the garbage rotting in our house. It's time to take out the trash. So confess it, repent 
of it, it'll diffuse the accusations of the enemy. So, if Psalms 81, 13 through 14, you can go back and read it at home. I'm not going to go through it all. But what it shows is, it shows how fast righteousness can change the whole environment in a hurry. So, but the breastplate gives for the Roman soldier's physical heart, righteousness does for their spiritual heart. It guards it, it protects it, it shields it from your enemies' attempts to attack the fatal blow to this life-giving source in your soul. But we have to understand how to use, utilize the spiritual armor because it requires us to truly understand what righteousness is and how it works. The concept of righteousness is mentioned many times in Scripture in several different capacities, so there's different kinds of righteousness. And we're going to look at a couple of those. So the first one is perfect righteousness. God is perfect as is his standard of righteousness. When we look at this type of righteousness, it's really, it shows us the only one who can achieve this righteousness, right, is God. None of us is going to be perfect. That's why the Lord and Savior had to come. He didn't send his son here because we could obtain perfection. So when we look at perfect righteousness, it, we know we're not achieving that, so that's clearly not our breastplate, right? It's going to be only about God, because Romans 3.23 tells us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If you go and you read Romans in chapter 3, or you read in Isaiah 64, both of those paint a picture and tells you no one, no one is righteous. So if God's perfection is what that was referring to, we'd all be in big trouble. It wouldn't work but we have a good God who always makes the way Amen. and shows us the way. Amen? Amen? So, mark this down and read this when you go home. It's 1 Kings 12, 25 to 33. And when you read it, it's going to be based off of what we're talking about right now. So, since God's perfect righteousness is an unattainable goal for us to reach... What's the solution? How do we shake free from our legalistic do-gooding while at the same time meeting God's standards? Donning the breastplate that keeps us protected from demonic assault. Well, and I see if a lot of us try to do this, we, we would like to lower or modify God's standard. But it doesn't work that way. God does not work that way. We, but we see it. We, we do it. We try to, well... God's not going to be upset about this because it was just a little thing. Or he's not going to be paying attention that I just done this because so-and-so's over here when they're doing this big thing. But God doesn't work like that. God's standard is God's standard. It won't lower to what we want it to lower. The bar was set, and we just have to try to achieve the best we can through him. So we can't bring his expectations down to our level. It's really, it would be a watered-down version, right? We don't want a watered-down God. We serve a powerful God. In Romans 10.3, it said, Not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. We can't establish our own. We have to subject ourselves to His. So the second kind of righteousness is comparative. So, in 1 Samuel 24, we see Saul and David's strange, that's where they have that strained relationship. That's, it's really like the climax, the climax of the movie. We're at the climax of the movie when we're in 1 Samuel 24. King Saul is jealously outraged by David's popularity among the people. Had set out to kill his perceived rival, and David, along with his little ragtag band of fighting men, had holed up in a cave to stare at their danger. But this is where we get to see when Saul stepped into the cave to relieve himself in verse 3. He was completely unaware that David was sitting in the dark recess of the cave watching his every move. So here's David. He's in the cave. And here Saul comes in. Could have took his life right then and there. But that's not what happens. So Saul was there. He was vulnerable. He was open to attack, right? David could have crept from the shadows and brought this whole thing to a final bloody end right there. But instead, he inched out of the darkness and merely cut off 
know the David Kodachokam, but didn't. But then what he does next is he measures his own level of righteousness against David's. Okay? And he found himself lacking to what he was comparing himself to of King David. So this is comparative righteousness. This is literally seen comparative righteousness. We cannot compare our righteousness to others. We are all, we can, it's like the worst, we love as travelers to compare ourselves up against other people's standards of what they're doing or where we are. We cannot. Comparison soothes, but it deceives. It makes us feel justified when sinful, with sinful actions. It can be disheartening when we feel that others are doing better than us. It's inaccurate and deceiving, which is why the devil loves when we do it. He works to keep us looking at others instead of God himself. And, you know, we, we can't compare and look at others, well, because what Aunt Lizzie's working on, I'm not working on. I'm working on something completely different. We're at different parts of our lives. We have baby Christians, we have senior Christians, and every single person is going to be working on something different. So, if Margaret goes out and slaps somebody in the face, I can't. her. So then we see over here we're oh, hold on imputed. Imputed righteousness is the third. So the cross took away the penalty of our sin. It doesn't just mean he's declared in a wash all that sin of yours. We'll just forget about all that. No, it's your sin and mine require a just payment. Death. It was for all of it, and Jesus paid it. Death for all of it, for all who would receive him by faith. He done it for us. He washed us. He washed us clean up that day. He erased the bad ones that was old. If, and honestly, that's the sum total of what the cross accomplished for us, escaping what we deserve, eternal separation from God and hell. This fact alone should be enough to garner our unending gratitude causing us to fall on our knees and odd worship every single day. You have nothing else to focus on in your life, in your spiritual walk. The best place to start is literally focusing on what he solely did for you. Because when you realize the magnitude of what he done for you, it doesn't matter what's going on around you. You can Amen. be thankful for that one thing. You can worship him for that one thing. You can pray to him and have a relationship to him for that one thing. It's the best starting place and focal point you could ever have. But the cross is the gift that keeps on giving because it didn't just take something from us. It gave something miraculous to us. When Jesus died on the cross, he gave us so much, so many benefits we didn't deserve. The veil was rent and we had access. We could go boldly before the throne. We was washed free of it so we could have never paid. It was the gift that keeps on giving. So in Genesis 15, 6, we see the story of Abraham. And it says, Abraham believed the Lord and he credited to him as righteousness. And that's Genesis 15, 6. We're going to open our Bibles for a minute. We're going to go to 1 Thessalonians 5, 8 to 9. So in 1 Thessalonians 5, Eight to nine. It says, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation. And then it goes on and it says, For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So remember I said we was going to look at a second breastplate, the Titan of righteousness. Well, here it is. It's the breastplate of faith. And love. First Thessalonians, what? Five? five chapter five, eight and nine. Mm-hmm. So when you read it, it tells you the breastplate of what? And you notice that that breastplate, and I want you to concentrate on those faith and love. So it's twofold. Twofold is two things working together as one. So faith towards God and love towards others and God. We have to have our faith in him, but we have to love not just him, but we have to love others. We have to love 
Mary and Catherine and Sarah, Margaret. We all have to love one another. It's important. God wants us to put on faith and love. So faith is important because when the enemy gets us doubting, it turns to unbelief. Like he can make us doubt so much that we actually can't shake ourselves off and we went to full-blown unbelief. And when we do that, it penetrates. That's something that penetrates our wrestling. This doesn't mean we have perfect days. We're going to have days where we doubt, we fall, the attacks get real. But we just need to pick ourselves up on those days and fall on our knees to him, and we can pull ourselves back up. But our key is faith. Faith is the ability to trust God and know that he will deliver. No matter how ugly or how horrible the situation, you've got to know that the God you serve is a way maker. Amen. He is our way maker. I love the song, Mary, I think you sang it. Amen. He's the chain breaker, the way maker. He's everything we could ever need for any situation. So we don't need to trust that our situations are just going to sit there and listen to the enemy and trust the enemy's lies of, oh, this ain't going to change. Because our God has told us that he will make a way where there was no way. He's not going to let us sit in that state. He's going to bring us through. So the important, you've got to believe God. Don't believe man. Don't believe the enemy. It's important to start believing God. And we're, we're going to go over to Romans for a minute. And we're going to go to chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. And it's going to be verse 3 through 5. And verse 3 says, Not only so, but we also boast in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces patience. Patience produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. We are going to go through things. We are going to go through trials, and that's five, and I'm going over to four in a minute. But God shows us the picture. He shows us what he is capable of. He always shows us. And that's what I love about Abraham's story, which is what we're going to look at. Because people look at it, people think that just because you have infertility problems, that Abraham's your go-to because he was promised a baby. But what we're going to look at is my favorite part of Abraham's story, which was not necessarily him getting the baby. So when we look at three there, it tells us, what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to him who works, wages are not given as a gift, but as a debt. But to him who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. That really, Abraham would have never, of his own accord, gotten anything good. But what did he, when we see Abraham, what we see is a faithful servant who loves the Lord. And the Lord credited to him. It was given to him as righteousness. It wasn't of his own might. It wasn't of his own power. It was God through him. And it was only based on the fact that he believed. It said he believed. So it was accredited to him. Amen. Having that belief system with God. In Hebrews 11, 6, it says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. It says, Live in faith and trust in him. You know, God never brings you to a certain point. He's not going to bring you and then abandon you. When he walked the Israelites through the wilderness, he didn't get them 20 years in and say, you know what, I'm done. I'm done. I'm walking away. Your life's here. Do it yourself. He was with them the whole time. If he brings you to when he's going to keep bringing you through, when he's going to bring you out the other side of it, he's a good God who loves us. Amen. In 2 Corinthians 1, he tells us that his promises are gay and amen. It tells us in Numbers 23, 19 that God is not a man that he should lie. Amen. So, you can go all through the scriptures. God is to be believed. Yes. You're to believe on him. He is the one that will never lie to you. He will never lie to you. He will never break his promise to you. He will always stand by his word. <clears throat> when you trust Jesus as your personal Savior, the penalty of sin is removed, and the gift of God's own righteousness is given. It's imputed to you. It is credited to your spiritual account. The perfection and holiness of God himself has become yours in Christ. 
you would never get it in your account if it wasn't for God. There's nothing we could ever do aside from God and allowing him to work through us and in us that could ever credit that spiritual account. So when God looks at you now, he no longer sees your humanity. He doesn't see our humanity or our frailty, our sin, or our unrighteousness. He sees you through the bloodstained filter of his own son. He put us in right standing. He sees us as his beloved children that he would do anything for. You are already complete. You're whole. You're perfectly. And why? Because Christ's gift to you. He made us and he perfected us. He made us so that we could be all things through who? Through him. It's all things through Christ. So when you look at that, perfect righteousness would what? It would discourage you. If you tried to be perfect, it would discourage you. You'd really be sad for Christ. Comparative righteousness is going to drive you mad because you're never going to get a good comparison up against somebody else. If I sit and try to compare myself against Margaret or anybody else, I'm really going to end up discouraged on the couch with my head buried. So imputed righteousness. That's the one we need to focus on with our wrestling. Amen. It defines you and declares you innocent before all accusers. Our enemy is the accuser of brethren, but God has made us innocent before our accusers. So the enemy is constantly on the warpath to keep you from realizing and utilizing this gift. He doesn't want you to rest in the fact that your sins have been completely forgiven. That your current status and position is one of complete righteousness before God. He knows as long as you don't see yourself as righteous. A righteous child of God. That you can never get around to wearing the breastplate that blocks him from successfully attacking the most vital part of your life. Your heart. The enemy loves to paint a picture to us that we're not being proper children of God. If he can make us feel like we're not achieving and attaining what we should be, he can actually drag us away. You see it. People fall away from church because of it. It puts you in this state where you're open for so many attacks because you're so discouraged with what you can't do. But it doesn't matter what you can't do because you can't do it, but guess what? God can. God can do it. This man, his name is Gigi Finley. And he wrote this thing, and he said, The completeness of pardon for past offense and the integrity of character that belong to the justified life are woven together into an impenetrable breastplate. We all have past offenses. We all have sins. I love what Jensen Franklin said one time. He said, I don't get upset when the devil tells me what was in my past and tries to use it to bring me down. He said, I use it to look and see and say, thank God I'm not with that man, and I'm farther and I'm ahead of where I was then, and that God has changed me. We can't be held, we can't let ourselves be held in that past with that old man and that old way. We're not that old man no more. We're not that old way no more. No, we're not perfect, but we're doing better than we was before. So no matter what your present circumstance or past entails, none of the elements of life can take away what the cross has given you. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 that the old things have passed away, and behold, new things have come. So, putting on and putting off. To put something on, you have to already, you have to take something off. If I went home right now, and I'm standing, and I have all this on, and I just started putting on my pajamas tonight, it would be really weird, wouldn't it? I would have to take these off to put on the pajamas. You have to put more things on. You have to take things off. So we have to look at each of the pieces of the spiritual armor. They were devices that represented principles he'd already explained in a series of verses from chapter 4. Chapter 4 is a really good place in Ephesians to go and read it. He'd introduced a fourth type of righteousness, the practical righteousness that we just talked about, the one we need to focus on. And he went to great lengths to explain what it looks and sounds like. And it says in... Ephesians chapter 4, 22 through 24. Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So Paul wisely used some key phrases that believers in the Ephesians culture would quickly identify and understand. In their day, part of the initiation process for a person involved in one of their pagan religions was to remove and discard their old clothing. 
Now I'm pointing that out because I want to point out to you, and me and Ed, I think I've talked about it with Aunt Lizzie, I know I've talked about it with Margaret. The Bible always spoke to the people in a way they could understand. If you have your ear open to God, he's going to speak to you in a practical way that you understand. He's not going to come at you like a college professor if you're not a college professor. And many times he shows me a picture of something before he ever begins revealing it to me because I'm a visual person. I like to see things. He's always going to do it in a manner that we can understand. He's going to meet us right where we are because he yeah. wants us to hear what he has to say. Mm -hmm. So we look in and through Ephesians and we're just going to touch them. And he's showing us the things that we are put off. We are to put off lying. We are to put off anger. We are to put off stealing. In verse 29, it tells us to put off unwholesome words. In verse 31, it says to take off bitterness, wrath, anger, outbursts, blasphemies, and malice. In chapter 5, it tells us to put off impurity, greed, filthiness, foolish talking, and coarse joking. These was attributes that was to be filtered out of our life that we was to put off. These are the things we want to get out. We want to start bagging them off one by one and letting them out the front door. So, lifestyle choices and habits. You may have indulged lust for so long or lived tethered to pride or anger for so many years that it's become a comfortable outfit for you. But they are symbolic of your old life, dated, antiquated, out of character. Putting it off daily won't be easy, but by God's spirit, it can be done. Amen. One thing at a time, day by day by day. Because you're never going to quit having something that has to be put off or dusted out. Every time you get rid of one, you'll find another one. That's why it says that we cannot be perfect until Christ comes back. We're always going to be working and ever-changing with the Lord. So putting off was not the end of Paul's instructions. Just because you've gotten unrest doesn't mean you're cold again. Putting off does not automatically equal putting on. Wearing the brightest plate of righteousness means replacing your own garments with carefully selected attributes that align with the light of Christ that is practical righteousness. It says in Ephesians 4.24, to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God. So in Ephesians 4, it also tells us some things to start putting on. We are to start putting on humility, meekness, patience, bearing in love. We are to put on eager, unity, peace. In 425, it tells us to put on truthfulness. It tells us in 32 to be kind-hearted and forgiving. And it's really important to be forgiving. It's important to be kind. It's important to be tender-hearted. These are things that he wants us to be towards one another. We're an army. And if we're busy knocking each other down, we're not going to be very fruitful. And if I hate the person who's fighting next to me, I ain't going to get very far. Because we need to be working together. We pray together. We worship together. We are the body together. We need to bear in love with one another. And I want to walk over in First John for a minute. And I want you to think about, keep thinking about we need faith and love and we need to be forgiving. Focus on these things. Focus on that second part of your breastplate. And set this one for this. So in First John 3, we're going to start at verse 10. If you have your Bibles, I go to open it. We're going to read nine scriptures. We're going to start right there in verse 10. And in verse 10 it says, In this the children of God and the children of the devil are revealed. Whoever does not live in righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Not like Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's works were righteous. Do not marvel, my brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love his brother remains in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, 
and you know that no murderer has eternal life remaining in him. By this we know the love of God, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, but closes his heart of compassion from him, how can the love of God remain in him? My little children, let us love not in word and speech, but in action and truth. So, at the beginning of that, when we go back up to verse 10, it kind of puts a perspective of us right there for you. The difference between being Christ and being the enemies is completely revealed in that scripture. Not living in righteousness and not loving your fellow brothers and sisters shows where you belong right now, where you're at if you're having those. It shows you if you belong to him or you belong to God. We have to love one another. In verse 18, it goes down and it tells us, let us love not in word and speech, but in action and truth. And I started to think about that in action and in truth. Truth is God. God would love everybody. Words can be empty. We can say things, but not mean them. I could go up to Nancy today and say, hey, if you need any help moving in or help with your grandson, just give me a call and I'll do it. But that doesn't mean I mean it. So it would be the action behind it. Here, you want me to come over and do it? Actually going over and doing it. So he doesn't want us to just pretend and just say that we love one another. Say that we love each other, but actually put that into action. Love them enough to pray for them. Love them enough to forgive them. And when you love them enough to forgive them, you're loving yourself enough to not have unforgiveness. And so that's why it needs to be in action and in truth. Me and Margaret loves to talk all the time about for every action, there is a reaction. Okay? And he wants us to love in action. Just like when she spawned in the movie, she had that black one. It's turned on fire and it started coming up and the fire, it was her reaction. We want those good reactions. We want to be sowing into things that's going to reap the good. Not unforgiveness is going to bring hideous things, things that we don't even want to have. So in 1 John 4, and it's verse 20 and 21, it says, If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For whoever does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? We have this commandment from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. We want to truly love God. We have to love his other children. We have to have love, mercy, and kindness for his other children because he loves them just as much as he loves us. It doesn't matter if they're not doing what's right and they've harmed you or anything else. You still have to love them. We are commanded to love them. It shows the love of God through us when we love the what? Unlovable. When we talk about how hard it is all the time to love the unlovable, we are called. To love the unlovable. So you have to. You cannot have hatred in your hearts. For your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And the truth of the matter is. You're going to get hurt. You are. Everybody in here. If they have not been hurt already. Is going to get hurt. Somebody is going to hurt your feelings. Hurt your ego. They're going to wound you. Generally it's somebody close to you. Sometimes it's. I, I, I always think that the biggest hurt is the people closest to you because people that's further, you have an easier time saying, well, she's not in my life anyway. But it's going to happen. It's going to come. But when you get hurt, you have to deal with it. And deal with it immediately. Don't sit. And I thought travelers do. We grew on everything. And the more we grew on it, the more badness we grew. Till we have, you can't believe the level of what we would say about this person, and they're like, you brewed, yes, I grew badness about it. You can't believe the things that we brewed, and we blow this thing out of proportion. We blow it up, and we made it bigger in our lives. But if we don't do that, if we quit brewing on things, and we quit calling to vent, and all of that, and we start to sit down and deal with it, and to deal with it immediately, the number one benefit it's going to have to us is it's not going to take root in 
in our hearts. We do not want unforgiveness taking root in our hearts for our own sex, for our connection with God. That is something we don't want in our You don't have to forgive them me and say that what they did was right to you. It doesn't mean that you're justifying what they did to you. You don't have to forgive for any of those reasons. You have to forgive so that you don't feel hatred for them. So that you stay in right standing with God. So that your heart is open and for your own self. It'll be more benefit to you to forgive them than it will for anything else. And, you know, when you allow it to take root, it's just like the brewing all over again. Because now it's sitting in here and it's bubbling. And it's bubbling and you hear their name and you cringe and you see their face and you're like, oh, I got to go to the other side of the room. I don't want to look at this today. Because it grows. When you plant something in your garden, it grows. When something takes root in you, it's going to grow if you don't pluck it out. A weed, if you don't pluck it out, it takes over the whole garden. So you have to begin to pluck that out so it doesn't cause the breach in your respite. And when you look up the word breach, it means an act of breaking or failing to observe an agreement or a code of conduct. God has given us our code of conduct. It's in here. It's all in here. This is our code of conduct. The second thing it means is to make a gap in and break through so we can make that crack. When it breaches you, it makes that crack, it makes that opening for, and how many knows when something opens, other things always come. It's never just that one little thing that you've let creep in, and how it compiles and compiles and compiles until you snap like the cheap soup and probably wipe out half the church in anger. It's not a good thing. And when we are allowing these breaches, it breaches the ability of our right standing with God because we're not acting in a way that God would have us act. We need to instantly fall to our knees, seek Him. You need to start taking the bruised relationships and make them right. You know, just because you make them right doesn't mean that the other person's going to respond. You could be the one wrong and you could forgive somebody and it doesn't mean that they are going to respond and they're going to accept it. But when you do it wholeheartedly and you truly forgive, then you're in right standing with God. You've done what God would have you do, and the other person will make their way, and they'll get there, and they'll come to it when they show. And that's what is important, because you don't want to let these things cause you to miss out on the riches of God's promises. God has promises for you, and you don't want to bully yourself. Predators don't want to be bold out of anything. Say there's dinner. Oh, we got free dinner on Sunday back here in the pavilion. People you haven't seen in two years will be here for free food because we love, we love free things. Well, God gives to us freely. He gives to us freely, and we need to turn around and give love freely because we don't get bold out of anything. Oh, free slides with Adidas for Black Friday. We're there. Oh, the sacks are for our clothes. We will not get bold out of a deal. So why would we let ourselves get bold out of the stuff God has for us? The worst thing you want to do is bowl yourself. So remember, day by day, moment by moment, choice and action. And guess what? Again and again and again and again. Shampoo says rinse and repeat if necessary. We have to rinse and repeat day after day after day after day. But thank God we can. We can change day after day after day after day after day. He took the penalty of our sin once and for all. So all we have to do is repent and keep being the best us through God that we can be every single day. We have to corral our flesh, which is, oh boy, the flesh, monumentally hard. There's nothing worse than when the flesh rises up. But when we do, we experience success, and it helps us to modify our behavior and and help us to modify our realities and things that are unaddressed. It's a struggle. It's a struggle. And it's going to be a struggle every single day. But the more you practice sitting on your flesh, the easier it's going to get. And it can be the simplest things that helps you sit on your flesh. When I used to want to go on Facebook and have an outburst post, I had a whole outburst I'd want to have because somebody aggravated me and, oh, really? Let me, let me get her back. What I would do is, so I couldn't hide it. I 
would go and I'd put the leash on my dog and we'd go for a long walk. While we was on that walk, there was no way that while I was walking the dog, I could put an antlers. It helped me sit on it until I got to the point where I would pray as I walked the dog. When people posted something, I didn't want to have the outdoors no more. It helped me change and because I controlled that area of flesh. It's hard. It's hard to sit on those opposite fracture. We're very tick for tech. Well, she done this to me, and she said this to me, so I'm going to say it to her. God don't want it. We have to crucify the flesh. That's going to be our hardest part. You know, Romans 7, 15 and 19 says, I do not understand what I am doing, because I do not practice what I want to do. But I do what I hate. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but I practice the evil that I do not want to do. How many knows that's the truth? I'm not going to do this today. It's just not going to happen. God's going to be good, and I'm not going to do it. And then you go out, and it's like the first thing. It does like the first thing you do is the very thing you say you wasn't going to do. But don't get discouraged by that. There's no condemnation in Christ. We're going to fail. And we're just going to pick up and keep going and trying again. We sometimes obey God on the outside while simmering disobedience on the inside. I had this experience with my energy drinks. I know energy drinks is no big deal to everybody else, but I'm telling you, they were like crack in my life. I, I still sit, I see people walk into church with them on Sunday and I rule. I'm like, ooh, that looks so good. I did not want to give them up. I did not want them out of my life. I liked them. I enjoyed them. So as I was cutting back, in obedience to God, inside I was like, oh, I don't know why you're making me do this, God. Everybody else gets to have all these wonderful things. All I want is my poor poverty energy drink. I was growing bad things on it. I was obeying while having an attitude on the inside, and I had to pray and review that attitude. So good behavior does not fail the sin. And if I wouldn't have started to do that, I'd have been in sin because I was actually told by God to give them up. So that would have been a sin for me to keep them. I was told to get rid of them. I needed to get those out of my life. God knew that they were doing nothing good, and he knew the effects of aspartame and everything else that was in them, and he said for them to be gone for pregnancy, and they had to be gone. Obedience. Obedience is important. So we are to be righteous through and through, not just in our behavior. So as we seek to put our practical righteousness into practice, it's firmly rooted in the verse that ties together the various put off and put on verses in Ephesians 4. And it's Ephesians 4, 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And the way he does it according to scripture is by renewing us in the spirit of our minds. It's what God's spirit does in us and for us. Thank you, Jesus. It's not something you or I can initiate. He does it. God's renewing work within us is what makes putting off and putting on possible. We could put off none of the bad attributes of the fruits of our neck. Remember, we talked about Sodom and Gomorrah. And all of how the daughters of Sodom, all they seen was the good. Literally, the only way we can put off our own things that we see that are wrong is literally through God, because it's Him. So practical righteousness is an essential, logical, organic offshoot of imputed righteousness. Righteousness is already in you. Now it just needs to be on you. You must make a conscious choice to act in a way that is consistent with your new life in Christ. And because the Spirit is always there to provide His renewing to your mind, your potential of producing spiritual fruit is not just potential. It's doable. We can do it. Day by day, little by little, piece by piece. Plant the seed of a strawberry, you're going to grow the strawberries. Slowly but surely. So we're going to look for a minute at sanctification, because it's important. We learned about it in the back room in our studies, and it is important. So 2 Thessalonians 2.13 says, God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. Sanctification is the process by which you are molded into the image of Christ. It's the Spirit's progressive influence on you. Over time, day in and day out, he conforms and he transforms your soul, your mind, will, and emotions, your heart, until it's increasingly operating in alignment with God's heart. And as the Spirit does his work, your thoughts and desires begin to inform and modify your actions and 
reactions. Your practice begins to align with the perfect nature of Christ in you. It is his soul. The man in our study at Columbia, he referred to it as God's soul. We are dirty. Our righteousness is but filthy rags, is what the Bible tells us. Sanctification is God's little soul. It cleans up our life. It cleans up our hearts. It cleans up our minds. In James, it says, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness and humility, receive the word and plant it, which is able to save your souls. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. The process of sanctification is progressive. God grows and changes us from one level to the next instead of all at once. How many knows every time you go to a higher level with God, there's a higher level of cleansing in your life. More and more things you have to come against you. You have to deal with it. It's almost like going through a desert place to get to that higher level. But it's always obtainable through him. Through him. So, it's important. It's critical. It says to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So, meditating on the word. Internalizing its principles and then implementing them in your actions is what supports the work of God's Spirit in renewing your soul, in growing you, in changing your case plots, in adapting what you find most of appetizing and fulfilling. If you only skim scripture, or it's the afterthought to you, or you let it go in one ear and out the other with little thought or determined interest, you'll never receive the full benefits of what the living, active Word of God is prepared to produce in your life. Who doesn't want the full benefits? The full benefits of God is so good. They're not like the full benefits when you go to a store and they're saying, well, if you get this card, you get these perks. And if you get this one, you get that. And you're like, I don't want half that stuff. The full benefits of God, you want it. There ain't nothing on that little checklist of God's benefits that you don't want in your life. Or if you don't, you shouldn't want in your life. We want you to reap the full benefits, not the on our sex. So we're going to turn for a minute to walk 2 Timothy chapter 3. And we're going to close with 2 Timothy chapter 3. And it says, starting in verse 2, Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Without natural affection, truce breakers, slanderers, unrestrained, fierce despisers of those who are good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasures, <coughs> more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power, turn away from such people. Those of this nature creep into houses and captivate silly women who are burdened with sins and led away with various desires, always learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Mary, you want to come up and play on the keyboard? I read this before we even started doing all of this, and me and Margaret was talking about this. Another version calls this gullible women. Gullible women. This one calls it silly. Well, I don't want to be gullible, and I don't want to be silly either. Those ain't things I want. But notice what it says. Those of this nature creep into houses and captivate the silly women who are burdened with sins and led away with various desires. Always learning, but never able, never able to come to the knowledge of truth. We talked about it last week. It's not just enough to have the knowledge of the truth. The knowledge of the truth needs to go in your heart. It needs to go in your soul, and it needs to go in your mind. The cares of this world can creep into your home so fast, and you are set free in Christ. Why do you want the silly things of the world to take you captive and creep into your home? Right? He wasn't, he didn't call us to be captives. He called us to be free. He says, he who the Son sets free is free indeed. So why would you let anything come and shackle you to anything? 
and get it up. 